if we never talk about the strengths of a child, we miss out on more than half of our human beings. We are not all the things that are wrong with us. We are not all the things that we cannot do. We are all the things that we can do and they need to be celebrated. Welcome to Tilt Parenting, a podcast featuring interviews and conversations aimed at inspiring, informing, and supporting parents raising differently wired kids. I'm your host, Debbie Reber. My guest today is Maria Kennedy, director of the Bridges Educational Group at Bridges Academy and host of Crucial Conversations on Cognitive Diversity, produced by the Bridges 2E Center for Research and Professional Development. Maria is also a speaker, author, and advocate and has been featured on Bright and Quirky and has received several awards for her teaching and leadership. Maria is passionate about working with twice exceptional students and training teachers to tap into the strengths of their gifted and challenged students. During this conversation, we will talk about how the definition of giftedness in some countries keeps gifted students from getting into gifted programs, the importance of appreciating every child's unique strengths and value, and ways parents can advocate for their children's learning profile, even within their existing school systems that may not be designed to support or understand neurodivergent learners. Maria likens the work she does to being on a crusade, and I just have to say I am here for it. But before I get to that, I want to give a quick shout out to Lindsay McFadden, Elizabeth O. Tuckermancy, and Helen Hughes. Thank you so much for being a part of my Patreon campaign and helping me cover the costs of producing this show. If you get a lot out of this podcast and want to join Lindsay, Elizabeth, and Helen in supporting it, you can sign up with Patreon to make a small monthly contribution. To learn more, visit patreon.com slash tiltparenting. Also, if you are newer to Tilt Parenting, I want to be sure you know about my book, Differently Wired, Raising an Atypical Child with Confidence and Hope. Differently Wired is part manifesto, part how to navigate the unique journey of parenting a neurodivergent child. If you haven't read it yet, I invite you to download the first chapter on my website at tiltparenting.com slash book. Thank you so much. And now here is my conversation with Maria. Hello, Maria. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Debbie. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be able to hang out with you today. I know. I wish we could do this in person. I think we'd have a lot of fun, but we'll have to be in our respective coasts for this conversation, at least. I would love if you could, as a way to get started, just tell a little bit about your story and maybe your personal why for doing this work and and how you got into doing the work that you do. So, yes, most definitely. So um, I'm an educator by profession and um, I got into education because I wanted to be a lifelong learner and my mother encouraged me to do it. Um, I've always worked really well with children and had worked with children with special needs. Um, Down syndrome children is where I had started originally. And then I got into elementary ed and then I had a small person of my own, my amazing young man, Aaron. And what we discovered was like his mother, he's gifted. At the age of three, he was doing single digit addition with carrying. Uh, he was obsessed with numbers, wanted to know everything there was to know about everything and had an, ama- an, an amazing memory. So if you read a book to him once, he would read it back to you verbatim. So this amazing young man goes to school and gets into trouble at school. And I'm going, the child's three. What can he possibly be doing to be getting into trouble and being sent out of class at the age of three? He was sent out of class at the age of three because he refused to sit and draw circles around the number three. And I said to the teacher, I'm not understanding what we're doing here. She goes, well, they're all three. So they're circling three bats, three balls. I'm going, the child's doing single digit addition with carrying. He can count beyond 100 forward and backwards in both English and in French, which he was learning at the time. He writes all of his numbers. He's not going to circle three. She goes, yeah, but that's what they're doing. I said, then just give him a, a sheet of sums. He'll happily complete them. So that was the first instant. Then the next one came out when she said, he won't read. 
Now, this is a kid that walks around with a book and a basketball, right? He was never parted from either one of those things. I'm going, what do you mean the child doesn't read? So she says, no, he won't read. And the rest of the class are reading and he won't read. So I said, well, how many words are on the page while this child won't read? And she goes, oh, there's no words on the page. I said, what are you talking about? She goes, well, they're books with pictures and the children are supposed to make up the stories. I'm going, I'm sorry, but my, I didn't even know such books existed and my son won't do that. I said, just read him a story and then he'll be blissfully happy. He'll reread that book, whatever. He kept on getting sent out. He was pushing the fold and my mother said, kid's got ADHD, he's hyperactive. So obviously I'm going, I don't want to be a parent in denial. So if there is something that my son needs, then I need to go get him tested. So obviously we took him to get tested. And the therapist said, the psychologist said, the kid's just gifted. And in that environment, he's not going to be able to be successful. And we needed to take him out. And um, I had always been, you know, stalwart about public education and kids being in public ed. And that's where they should be. And we shouldn't be sending them to private school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So poor me had to send my child to private school because that was the only place that his needs could be met and the place where people would be flexible enough to give him what he needed. So as a result of that, working in public school, I'm going, these kids need the same access that the kids in private school have. And so that then has kind of become my mission. What do my kids need and what are they not getting in their, in their education? And um, one of my students, um, a seven-year-old, I was teaching and he, again, like my little man, was a math wizard. So at seven, he was doing uh, long multiplication and long division. And what absolutely terrified me was well, when I was bragging on this kid and how amazing he was, uh, the teacher who was going to get him in two years said to me, I must stop teaching this child at this level. And I looked at her and went, excuse me, what do you mean? She goes, well, when he comes to me, what will I teach him? I, I wanted to cry. I'm going, you'll take him from wherever he is to the next level. She goes, but that's not what we're doing. And you're already teaching him stuff that he's not supposed to get till he gets to me in two years. So the crusade began from there. Um, so as I have traveled, I have been really, really blessed and fortunate to not only teach in the UK where I'm from, but I was also able to teach in the Caribbean and um, coming over to the States, I've taught on the East Coast and then was gifted Bridges Academy, where uh, there are all these amazing people who believe the same as me, that we should take children from where they are to the next level. So find out what they're good at, work with their strengths and then move them on. Um, and also one of the interesting things was in all of my travels, I have met children who are not your typical gifted child, so they don't excel in everything. Um, they have struggled in areas. And for me, it just made sense to me that they just needed help. So we supported them where they were. We helped them with the things that they struggled with. I came up with creative ways to do things in the classroom um, so that they didn't feel that they were stupid and not able to do but that was just kind of second nature to me. But I'm as I've traveled, I fought with people who were very, very rigid in their thinking and believing that education is only taught in this way. I mean, no disrespect, but I was completely blown away when I came to the States and teachers actually taught from a teacher's handbook and actually read a script. I couldn't understand how you could stand there with 20 little babies in front of you and read them a script from a book. I'm going, the people who wrote the book don't know your 20 children. How are we only teaching this specific text? Um, and so I threw those things away. <laughs> Ever since, yes. I love the, that you use the word crusade and the fact that you have experience, you know, working in different countries in the UK. We have a very international audience for this show and when I launched it, I was living in the Netherlands. I have a sense of what's happening in the Netherlands with regards to neurodivergent learners. Not much is what I'll say, but I'm I'm wondering what the scene is like, you know, in some of the other places compared to with what you've seen in the in the US. Cause I hear from listeners who live in the UK who are really feeling stuck in those systems as well. So can you kind of give us a bit of the landscape? Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, basically it's it's like 
banging your head into a brick wall. They have yet to recognize that there are multiple needs and that neurodivergent children even exist. And so unfortunately, the predominant philosophy in the United Kingdom, even today, is that often when a child doesn't conform to the norm, is that they're a problem. And so um, so my friends who are still there are working with children who have been identified as behavioral problems. And what they try to do is to control the behavior of the children, right? And so so despite the fact that the child may be may be on the autism spectrum, may have ADHD, but they may be really, really gifted um, and, and talented in an area, they might get one pull-out class, they might get one activity, but nobody as yet is looking at the strengths of the child and moving them forward. What they're literally doing is despite the fact that um, the 2014 Education Act talks about main mainstream education in the classroom as the preferred way to um, to educate neurodiverse students. We still have like, you know, schools that are solely for special needs, but the the focus on the students is that deficit model. So it is still looking at what can't they do? How do we get them to that level where they can test well? And Probably the worst thing and the thing that's most scary for me is how do we control their behavior so that they're compliant? Because that's basically what they want. They literally want our children simply, for want of a better word, to be little androids that are little robots that sit in a classroom and don't cause a problem. And so anybody that is a divergent thinker, anybody who does not conform is then looked upon as a problem and the work done is to make them conform. So it's not to explore any strengths. It's not to teach them how to, you know, to be creative and how to perform outside of the box, whatever what that box is. It's more to, to control, um, you know, so how, how do we make everybody just the same? And um, for those of us who have traveled and have been fortunate enough to be in the States and in places where people do think differently, we recognize that, that there is far more needed. So when I was in the Caribbean, again, it was definitely the deficit model. And part of the problem I felt, particularly in the Caribbean, was that there is a stigma about your child being identified as being different. And so, yes, if your child can get into a gifted program, so if they can get the gifted label, then that's wonderful and everybody celebrates that. Unfortunately, getting the gifted label in the Caribbean is very, very difficult, particularly because there's this limited scope. And so the definition of gifted um, in the Caribbean islands that I was working in, you had to be schoolhouse gifted in English, mathematics and science. And so if you didn't test well in all three areas, you didn't get the gifted label. So my son is a, is a math genius almost. I use genius loosely because, you know, but in my opinion, the boy's a math genius, right? I'm, I'm a proud mom, but he's really, tr- I mean, amazing in mathematics. He was also amazing in science. Read, like I said, at the age of three, but couldn't get into the gifted program in the Caribbean because his writing skills weren't at the same level. Now, his writing skills weren't at the same level because he hated to write. It was something that he found tedious, didn't interest him, and he did the minimum required. And, you know, you just couldn't encourage him to do it any other way because of the way that they did. the boy didn't want to write a five, you know, the five paragraph essay with the da 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 da. It's not that he can't do it. The child's just uh, just completed a master's degree in human resources. So he can do it. But it was just at the time, this is not what he wanted to do. Because he didn't want to do that, because he didn't perform at the level they required, he couldn't get the gifted definition. And for me, as an educator, that was frustrating. I was desperately trying to convince people that a child shouldn't have to perform in three areas to be deemed as gifted. They should be able to be gifted in whatever they're gifted in. 
right? So whether they're athletically gifted, artistically gifted, musically gifted, academically gifted, I'm going, we need to broaden the scope of the word gifted and really explore where these children are at so then that we can use those gifts and talents and educate using those strengths. But that was another battle that I fought in the Caribbean. So East Coast, similar problems. And then, of course, like I said, I'm over here where, thankfully, because of the culture here, I'm now able to share what I've learned and found my tribe, as we say, over here. Because it was it was really, really comforting to actually finally realize that I'm not the lone voice shouting in the wilderness. <laughs> like, you know, I felt like I'm... The, there have been times when I felt that maybe I'm crazy and maybe because my child is gifted, maybe because his mother was gifted, maybe we were just so far off the the, the scope that, you know, that there were no other people like us. Right. And so um, coming over to the West Coast, being able to work in this amazing environment and being introduced to the 2E community, which I feel everybody needs to know about, has enabled me to realize that, yes, I am not crazy and there are other people like me. But we definitely need to empower everybody and share that message so that people understand that their children can just be gifted in one area and be neurodiverse so have an area of challenge but but they should be supported and not like we do in the UK kind of shoved in a cupboard and hidden away i still feel that we do that at home when i was growing up if you were neurodiverse basically you went to a special school and people hid you and they ignored you and that was how come i ended up working with kids who were down syndrome because they went to a special school and um i went out of my way because they were not allowed in my school. You know, they were kept to wet. And I'm going, but there are other people who do different things and I need to know them and learn all about what they do because they're slightly different to me. And I feel that it's important that if we're going to live harmoniously in the world, that we all know about everybody, you know, and, and, and can understand each other. So, so yeah, I had put myself in a, in a different position. And I consider myself really blessed and fortunate to be able to travel and work with lots and lots of different people. Yes, and that feeds into your lifelong learning value there. We'll be right back after this quick break. During this month of planning and organization for big transitions, rhythms and routines have been absolutely essential for our physical and emotional well-being. So Green Chef nights are reliably and predictably a good night. We know the ingredients will be fresh and prepped, the instructions easy to follow, and the meal delicious. We're all still talking about last week's turkey tacos with mango chimichurri sauce, refried beans, and Monterey Jack cheese. Green Chef contributes to a healthy lifestyle with easy and delicious menus like fresh seasonal salads and grain bowls, and with over 80 weekly meal and market options, plus rotating options to suit a variety of lifestyles, whether Mediterranean, plant-based, calorie-smart, keto, protein-packed, gluten-free, there are always plenty of options to choose from. Whatever you select, you'll get farm-fresh ingredients, organic whole fruits and veggies, and premium proteins all delivered straight to your door. I love those four words straight to my door. Oh, and one more thing I love about Green Chef, they have an app, which means it's easy to manage meal preferences and delivery from your phone if you want to. And I, for one, want to. I am in that mode where I'm making the most of little moments like waiting in line at the pharmacy or for the F train to pull into the station to tackle all of those to-dos. So the convenience of an app is key for me. Green Chef has a special offer for Tilt listeners. Go to greenchef.com slash Tilt50 and use code Tilt50 to get 50% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's 50% off plus 20% off your next two months when you use the code Tilt50 at greenchef.com slash Tilt50. Maybe I've watched too many seasons of The Amazing Race, but every time I have to go somewhere on the subway, I treat it like a competition. It's all about making the right gut decisions about which route will get me there the fastest. Sometimes those decisions get me where I'm going early, and other times my gambles don't really pay off. 
Probiotics can't help with most gut decisions, but if your gut needs a little support, Ritual has your back. Their Symbiotic Plus, a three-in-one supplement, has clinically studied prebiotics, probiotics, and a postbiotic to support a balanced gut microbiome. I've been using Symbiotic Plus for about six months now, and it's become a core part of my morning routine. I take the mini capsule every morning while making my way through my inbox, whether I'm at home or I'm on the road, because it doesn't need to be refrigerated. And the capsule itself is delayed released, which helps it survive the harsh conditions of the upper GI tract for delivery to the colon. And that's exactly where we want it to go. Ritual invested in a study modeling the human colon, which showed that Symbiotic Plus significantly increased microbial diversity and the growth of beneficial bacteria. There's no more shame in your gut game. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. Get 25% off your first month for limited time at ritual.com slash tilt. Start Ritual or add Symbiotic Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash tilt for 25% off. As you were talking... I was thinking of, we are, we have a mutual friend in Scott Barry Kaufman and he wrote the book on gifted and, and what you're speaking to is just listeners. If you haven't read that book or, or I did an interview with Scott a couple of years ago about that book, but it is, it's just a different way of thinking about what gifted means. And, and there is a lot of unlearning. I think that so many people have to do in order to change and reframe their definition there. Definitely. Yeah, I think I think we're I think we're limited. One of the things that's always aggravated me is that often people aren't open to something new because they've always done it this way. And I'm going just because we've always done it this way doesn't mean that that's the only way or the right way. You know, as I mean, years ago we didn't have the World Wide Web. We didn't have computers. So should we not have them now? We now have the technology. And I'm going, education needs to move in such a way that we broaden our definitions and that we definitely reach out and meet those needs of those children that have been underserved. I was at an online conference thing that it was the Stanford one. And there were lots of people who were talking about the fact that they hadn't been identified as neurodiverse until they were in their adulthood. For a lot of them, what had happened was, was as they were taking their children through their struggle, right, and things were being pointed out that their children were having issues with, they recognized that they too had had those issues. And a guy in his late 40s finally was identified as having had ADHD his entire life. Another guy was dyslexic and he goes, well, if I had only known, my life could have been so much easier had I known these things earlier on. So yeah, so I'm going, we've we've just got to widen the scope, I think, and celebrate neurodiversity. I think think part of the, the concern for me is that stigma about people being different and them not wanting to be different. And I'm going, but we're all supposed to be different. If we all look in the mirror, we don't all look the same. So we were all designed to be different. And there's nothing wrong with that. Our differences should be celebrated. We all bring gifts to the table, however you want to use the term gifts. But I think everybody is good at something. So we all bring something to the table. And if we can broaden the way we educate so that Everybody can identify their strengths and everybody can use those strengths and everybody's strengths can be celebrated. I think we'd have more successful people in general, not just children, but more successful people. Um, And so that's one of the things that I'm trying to help people do. Yeah. In a society that works better, I just interviewed earlier today, Kathy Adams, that episode will have come out by the time this episode airs. She wrote a book called Zen Parenting, and we were talking about dignity and the importance of parenting with dignity. And that's really what we're talking about is recognizing that we all have value in everyone in who we are. Exactly. I, th- I think celebrating the value of us all is crucial. And if we can start from there, you know, um, And so if we can start with the fact that we all have value and everybody is here for a reason, we all bring something to the table and 
as educators, if we can find what that is in each of our children and build on that. And if as parents, we can instill that self-worth and self-value in our children and let them know that, yes, of course, we love them, but also we're really happy that they're here and that they're adding to the world, you know. Um, I keep telling my little people, I'm going, I need you to look after the planet because us old people have messed it up. So <laughs> I need you to be the people that know what's going to be good for the ozone layer and all of that good, good stuff. If we're not encouraging people to think and celebrating their ability to think, then we we won't move forward you know, I, I love to tell people, I'm going, if you were waiting on me to, to build an iPod or to build a computer, we'd never have them. We won't have cars that fly if you're requiring me to create them because I don't know how to do it. But I am sure that there are children coming up who are going to be able to create flying cars and goodness knows what else. But not if their education is stifled, not if they're led to believe that that they're stupid. One of my kids, uh, when I was teaching on the East Coast at a charter school, um, so he had ADHD, hated school, was always a behavior problem. And um, we did a project on uh, for Black History Month and we did a wax museum. And what I encouraged my kids to do was pick somebody, right? Find out about them and then become that person. So they got to dress up as that person and they had to create some form of speech to tell people who they were. Uh, it could be a minute. It could be two minutes. It could be three. It was really up to them. They could do pictures. And this little boy, whose name I won't, repeat just in case his parents here but he was he was terrified of doing doing that and I'm going well what do you want to say and so I scribed for him and we practiced together and he had his little cue card and on the actual day when people were coming around the gym um, they would come up to the kids and there was a little button on the floor that said press and you put your foot on it and then the kids would start talking it was the cutest thing on the planet and this little kid of mine when the first person came up, pressed, and so he read his card, and then they congratulated him and, and said how wonderful it was. And he ran over to me and told me that, you know, he had said his script. So I'm going, well done. That's awesome. You're going to do it again? Yes, sure. So he went back to his spot. He came back later, was no longer using the card because he knew what he wanted to say. And he knew this person because we had done some research and watched videos and stuff. But nine people had come and shared with him what he knew about his famous person. And he was so proud of himself. And his parents came. They took pictures of him dressed up in his costume. And he talked about this for weeks it was an opportunity for him to present in a different manner. So he didn't have to write, you know, um, and for him talking, he was very good at talking. He could, he could talk all the time. One of the things we would say in classes, could you just stop for a second? Right. So but we used his gift. We used that strength. And he recognized that there was value in that. And then in other lessons, he was able to draw on that ability and was encouraged to talk about what he knew, you know, and that was a real turning point and a change for him. So that's why I know when we work with our children's strengths, when we encourage them to see the value in themselves, then we completely change their lives and we can then change the life of gosh knows how many more people in the entire world in which we live, which I'm super excited about. It is exciting. I'd love to hear about more about your work at Bridges. So you've landed at obviously like the right place for you. And I'm sure there's probably a mutual love thing going on is my hunch. Tell me more about the work that you're doing at Bridges and what you're really excited about. More or less excited about almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I looked out and I, I tell people constantly, a friend of mine was over here some years ago um, during the summer doing a science program and um, discovered this amazing school and told me about it. And so I came originally and I worked, um, I was the director of the Phoenix program, which is the division for our fourth through sixth graders. And, um, and that's phenomenal. I get to work with truly amazing people. We created some additional programs.
programs, an after school program, some outreach stuff, some extra, extra stuff that the children were doing. But as a result of that, they've been kind enough, because I want to do more outreach, they've been kind enough to allow me. So I'm now the director of the educational group, and I do outreach. So I have um, I have a webcast called Crucial Conversations About Cognitive Diversity that the amazing Scott Barry Kaufman started, and I have now taken over. And so that's a monthly opportunity for me to have conversations with people in the field, we're also going to be talking with with parents and 2E people so that we share information. And that's really what I want to do. I want to share information with educators because I believe educators are the key. If they cannot see children as more than just uh, a test score, then they're not going to help them. And so Crucial Conversations is all about empowerment and sharing of knowledge. And then I'm working with a few other people to reach out into the community to find out what parents know. With that in mind, I'm working with our um, graduate school. We're going to have a symposium in March, which will be phenomenal. So it's going to be on Saturday, March 12th. It is online, so you can um, tune in from anywhere in the world, which will be super exciting. And it has two strands. It's aimed for parents um, to introduce them if they don't already know to 2E and then to give them some skills and some tools and some terminology that they can use in conversation with educators to get the needs met of their of their students, with therapists and doctors and with the, the local education authority if they're having to go to appeals with IEPs, etc. But also the second strand is for educators and we'll be looking at what we over here call the four pillars which is the the great structure that we now have for how we do uh, education here at Bridges. And um, the first pillar that we're going to be looking at is dual differentiation, because we know it's very difficult for people within the classroom to really hone that skill and to make things different for the children that they're working with. You know, often um, Susan says that um, one of the things she quoted, she says, oh, well, somebody said to her that uh, the kid w- enjoyed music. And so their definition was, well, they play music in the background. And she's going, well, that's not what we mean about dual differentiation. We're looking at how are we allowing children to demonstrate their knowledge? How are we enabling them to access the knowledge in the first place, right? And whether they're auditory or visual learners, you know, what you structure and make available makes a real difference for how they even access the curriculum. And then, as I mentioned with my son, how you encourage them to share what they know makes an, another difference for how you, A, find out whether or not they've learned anything, but also how they engage with the curriculum itself. And so during our symposium, we're going to be helping um, our educators identify those needs and um, we'll have a few giveaways, but they'll need to check into our our website, which will be uh, 2ecenter.org forward slash 2e dash symposium. And if they check that, there will be lots of information about the symposium. And then later on in the year, hopefully, we're, we're hoping that around November, we'll be actually able to have an in-person symposium so people can actually come over to this amazing place, Bridges, and see what it is we do um, and get a taste of the Bridges life Um which we're, we're trying to help other people learn those skills because we firmly believe that, you know, once you've found something good, then you shouldn't keep it to yourself. You definitely should share it and allow other people to um, to access those things. First of all, I'm super excited about the symposium and listeners. I will have the link in the show notes page. I highly encourage you to register to be a part of this. I had the pleasure of attending and speaking at the last live symposium, which was in, I think, November 2019. And it was hands down the best event that I'd ever been to. And 
I remember calling my husband and just saying, oh my gosh, I finally, like, these are all my people. And I never felt like I belonged anywhere, you know, that in that way ever before in my life. And it's really exciting, the work that you're all doing. And, you know, I know there's a Bridges school. Uh, The second Bridges school is meant to be opening in Seattle, where I used to live. So exciting. That is right. That's right. So it it will open in the fall of this year. Wow. It's so exciting. And I love that that you are spreading the wealth. You're you're sharing the, the resources and really, you know, not just keeping this to yourself, but trying to support educators and other school systems to really embrace some of these approaches that you found to be so successful. I'm wondering if you could just tell me what you see as being kind of the biggest roadblocks. What's standing in our way the most from other school systems being open to making these kinds of changes to their approach? I would say it's that that belief that that a child cannot be gifted and have a learning difference. Lots of people that I have met still are struggling to get their head around the concept of neurodiversity, right? Um, I think for the longest time, we have only spoken about gifted ed. So gifted ed has been a separate topic all by itself, right? So you have your mainstream children, and then if you're really lucky, you get to go to gifted ed if you're really smart, right? And so that creme de la creme, that top five, 10% of the population are in gifted ed, right? And then most people then are in mainstream. And then, of course, if you were in special ed, you know, they looked down their noses at you. They hid you away to the side. You were almost a mistake. I mean, these things are just like awful. I mean, so many of the the children have come into Bridges and their parents have been traumatized by their experience. And one of the things that I have said to parents when their kids come is your child is not broken. It is not my job to fix your child because your child is not broken. Your child is just not understood. And that's where we have to start. We have to start by understanding. And so because of that lack of understanding of those two tiers, um, Susan talks about our kids being blue and yellow um, at the same time. So because they have the GIF and because they have an area of challenge, they hit two completely different places. And those Entities have been separate for forever, but our 2E population actually combine both the gift and their challenge. And people need to be able to recognize that just because the child, one of my favorites is just because the child may talk a lot and may give you contrary arguments or reasoning, right, for something when you present something, they're not necessarily being argumentative. Being able to debate is actually a skill. And maybe if we could be more open to looking at what we have deemed first to be negative behaviors, if we could stop looking at them solely as negative behaviors and start looking at them as skills. So does this child come with a skill for conversation? Does this child come with the skill for thinking and being able to give justifications and reasons, right? So they're able to debate. They're able to speak. Maybe they're good orators, right? Maybe they can look at something and see what's wrong with it. Maybe this is a skill. And so let's not just instantly jump to the conclusion that this child is badly behaved because they don't fit your particular perception of what an eight-year-old is supposed to do. I mean, I've got eight and nine-year-olds who hold full on conversations with adults, know stuff that I didn't even learn when I was in high school, had to wait till I got to college to discuss these things, can hold full on conversations, and then later on can throw a temper tantrum like a two-year-old, right? So what got them there? What happened? What are our worries? I mean, A lot of my children have anxiety, but people don't stop to understand what's actually going on. So when a kid is is panicked that their parents have left, 
Why are they panicked? Are they concerned? When you talk to some of my children, you discover that, well, they know about the amount of accidents that happen on the road. And they're quite concerned that maybe their parents may have an accident because maybe they were involved themselves in an accident and therefore they're very aware of what happens or they witnessed an accident. And people dismiss that as something that we shouldn't worry about and you'll be fine and stop worrying about it. But hello, it's real. People have accidents every day. You know, you don't leave your house planning to have an accident, but these things happen. Um, And it's called accident because it's not intentional. So, you know, so there is a realistic um, sense of fear there. I mean, lots of us are scared of little things that crawl around and those fears don't make any sense because obviously you could squash the bug if you wanted to. I'm not saying that we should. Lots of my babies love bugs, but you could. So why are you scared of it? But being worried that that something bad can happen to somebody, that's actually a, a realistic fear. And so maybe if people could understand to explore what's going on with our children, to talk more in depth to them, to find out what they're thinking and where their, their, their stressors are, then we will, um, you know, we'll better be able to, to to serve these children's needs and expose them to things. And just like, oh, you're so good at holding conversations. So let's use that skill. Let's set that up. Let's do some skits. Drama is phenomenal. Lots of my high schoolers here um, at Bridges, when you talk to them because they've been allowed to be in the drama production they'll tell you that they came alive being able to learn about somebody else and then to be them on the stage. And it gives them an opportunity to step away from themselves and to explore things. You know, um, some of my kids now have done like shows and they've been stand-up comics and before they wouldn't say boo to a goose. And you're going, what? And um, and we're blessed to have an amazing music program. And one of my students, when he was in Phoenix, barely spoke to anybody. They did a coffee house the other day, and he was a lead singer of a band. I can't tell you how proud of him I was. My heart just swelled because I'm going, oh, my goodness, he's gone from this frightened person into somebody who can stand up in front of people and sing. But that's because he's been supported in an environment and then been able basically to find his voice and been encouraged to do something that possibly in another environment he wouldn't have been encouraged to do. So um, I think it's our, our, our requirement to put limits on people prevents us from truly seeing who they are. And if we can open our eyes and look deeper into and be prepared to find out who these children really are, then I think that what we can then offer them will be greatly changed. So good. And I love that story. And yeah, I mean, it goes back to what you were saying about compliance and what are we really doing here, right? We're raising humans. We're not raising these kind of neat little robot children who just do as they're told and don't think critically and don't learn how to really tap into to their gifts and their strengths. We'll be right back after this quick break. Hey there, it's Debbie. I love making this show and sharing conversations about how to support our awesome neurodivergent kids. I've seen how even one little insight from an interview can spark a big shift in daily life. But I know that raising complex kids can be messy and lonely. And just when we think we figured it out, something comes up that boots us right back to feeling overwhelmed and stuck. That's why I've poured everything into creating a way for parents like us navigating complex parenting journeys to join together and chart a path that feels positive, hopeful, and doable. It's the brand new Differently Wired Club experience. In the club, you'll get personal support from me and other seasoned parent coaches, six live calls every month where you can connect and get your personal questions answered, the opportunity to learn directly from authors and experts like I have on this show, monthly themes for getting specific and tactical, an exclusive private podcast feed, and the best, most generous community of parents. Seriously, these folks show up for themselves and each other, and that right there is really everything. Because it's a daily reminder that we're not alone. Our kids aren't broken, and we have totally got this. 
The recently rebooted Differently Wired Club is on a brand new platform with its very own iOS and Android app. It is such a great space. However you learn, whatever your style, no matter the ages, genders, and neurodivergent profile of your children, the Differently Wired Club can help you cultivate the positive shifts you're hoping for. Join us today by going to tiltparenting.com slash club. That's tiltparenting.com slash club. I hope to see you on the inside. Are you overwhelmed by the things that get in the way of you doing what you want to do? Are you looking for ways to simplify life to better align with your values? Do you want to create space in your schedule so you have room for more of the good stuff? Play, joy, relationships, gratitude, and more? If you answered yes to any of these questions, I invite you to check out Edit Your Life, a podcast to help you edit the unnecessary from your life so you have more room to enjoy the awesome. Through episodes with me, Christine Ko, and a range of super smart, compassionate, and thoughtful guests, you'll come away with big picture insights and practical ways to declutter your home, schedule, and mental space without getting bogged down by perfection. I have always believed that small moments and actions matter tremendously. My goal is to help you find agency and space in your life through doable baby steps that will leave you feeling accomplished instead of overwhelmed. Check out Edit Your Life wherever you enjoy your podcasts. For a parent who's listening to this, just as a way to kind of wrap up, um, because so many parents are not able to send their child to a school such as Bridges, and they are navigating this in a probably a more closed minded system. Do you have any advice for a step they could take or things they could focus on as they try to effectively advocate for their two E kids? Most definitely. The first thing you've got to do as a parent, in my humble opinion, is to find out who your child is, because you cannot advocate for a human that you don't understand. So your first job is to find out what makes them tick. Here we say, what turns the light on in their eyes? What is your child really passionate about? So as I told you, my small person was into numbers. He used to sit down and write down numbers from the catalog and add things up. Numbers made his brain go crazy. He loved it, right? So we did lots of things with numbers. So As a parent, you need to know what excites your person and then encourage that. So, you know, so take them out, have lots of experiences where they can become experts about the things that they like. Once you know what that is, then you're in a much better position to then talk to the people who are educating your child about what your child's passions are. And you'll then also know what to look for. So, You know, there's nothing to say that your eight year old can't be taking some course that's being offered at a college at some and something that they're interested in or even at a university. In the UK, we've we we had a nine year old who was at university. Right. So they may not be emotionally ready to do a whole university classes, you know, be there all day, every day. But there are courses that are being offered all over the place. And so once you know what your child is passionate about, what gets them excited and interested, then you want to feed that passion and encourage that passion and then encourage the educators by sharing that passion and enable your child to share their passion as often as possible. You know, so give them opportunities to share that passion with the relatives when they come round, but not in a not in a negative. You 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 must perform, but you know, encourage them to share. So, for instance, if they're artistic, then have their artwork out so that people can see it. Most people use social media, so you're on social media all of the time. So then share some of the stuff, the cute things and the wonderful things that your child is doing with your friends and family so that there is that conversation, that celebration, so that your child can feel that they're, what they're interested in is of value. Because then when they have self-confidence in what they're doing, then they'll share it better. And then when you then go into those meetings with educators, then you'll be able to talk about it. If your child does have an IEP and you're in an IEP meeting, then you'll be able to talk about your child's strengths. And you have to get that conversation conversation in. Um, IEP meetings are notoriously all about your child's deficits. If we never talk about the strengths of a child, we miss out on more than half of our human beings. 
We are not all the things that are wrong with us. We are not all the things that we cannot do. We are all the things that we can do and they need to be celebrated. So as parents, as educators, we need to know what it is our children are great at, what they can do, and then be able to share that and empower our children to feel good about themselves so that when we come to tackling the things the areas in which they struggle, they don't start life feeling that they're a failure. They don't start out branded as the kid that can't do anything. You know, it's cool to be a nerd (laughs) um, in some aspects, right? So, but let's celebrate those things, right? So let's celebrate whatever our children are good at. And as parents, it starts with you. So you have to be encouraging them and celebrating and finding out what their skills are and then sharing those and being proud of them and being positive about what they do well. And then those areas of challenge, then have those conversations and ask the educators, is there a way that we can utilize what my child is good at to help them in those areas that they're being challenged in. I taught my brother to read. I taught my brother to read back because he needed to make a kite. And so we got a book about making a kite. I taught a seven-year-old kid in my class to read by reading comic books because the books didn't, regular books didn't work for him. We read comic books. And when it clicked for him, when he could see um, that connection and make that connection, he then went on and was able to read newspapers. He was able to transfer that. But it took a desire and a passion. We had to find something that interested him, that he wanted to read, for him to be prepared to try and learn how to do it. You know, so look for those passion things, because when your child has a passion with something, you'll be amazed at how using their passion can encourage them to learn anything else that they need. A hundred percent. Maria, you definitely sound like you're a woman on a crusade and I am here for it. I love the passion you bring to this work. And yeah, I just really appreciate everything you shared. Such great advice, good food for thought for all of us listening who are trying to help our kids really become those self-actualized adults who know themselves so well and know how to create the life that they want for themselves. We've shared the symposium. Is there anything else, anywhere else that you want listeners to go check out online? Certainly listening to the Crucial Conversations podcast, but where else do you want people to go? We have two e-news. So it's a newsletter and um, we have a quarterly variations magazine. So if they go to our 2E News website and register, they'll get all of the articles. We are so blessed that people from around the world, um, there's just like amazing people contribute to 2E News. And so there is a wealth of information that is provided there. Um, And on our page also, there are um, information about events, um, other conferences and things that people might find useful. And of course, they can always email me. I want to be a resource and a conduit for anybody that needs help. So they should feel free to email me either directly, maria.kennedy at bridges.edu, or through our Crucial Conversations link uh, from the website. Um, Either way, so questions about stuff, email me. I'm going to be starting a blog. Uh, One of the things that I want to do is is people email me questions, then I'm going to find out answers and post those in a blog because I'm just thinking of how else I can help people. So if people have questions and they share them, what I don't know, I am so blessed to know so many amazing people like you, Debbie, who I can go to for information. And I just want to be able to share that with people. So, you know, so just get in touch and any way that I can help, I am definitely prepared to do that. That's fantastic. And listeners, I'll have links for all of these resources in the show notes. And I get two e news, I get variations. And yeah, there are such great in depth articles. There was one episode I'm thinking, or one issue I'm thinking of. There's a TUI expert in the Netherlands that I had never heard of before that I got to do a deep dive. So anyway, wonderful resources for sure. So check those out. Maria, I hope the symposium goes 
Wonderfully. I look forward to attending that. And yeah, just thank you so much for everything you shared today and for the work that you do in the world. Thank you so much. It's just been an absolute honor and a pleasure to get to hang out with you again. You are truly amazing. Thank you so much, Debbie. You've been listening to the Tilt Parenting Podcast. If you want to dig deeper into this episode, check out the show notes page. Every episode has a dedicated show notes page on my website where you can get links to all the resources we discussed, read a transcript, and even easily go back and listen to key takeaways by using the chapters feature on the podcast player. To get to the show notes page for this episode, just go to tiltparenting.com slash podcast and select this show. If you love this podcast and want to help cover the cost of its production, please consider joining my Patreon campaign. For as little as $2 a month, you can help cover the cost of the hosting platform for this show, my wonderful new editor and producer, Andrea, and more. It's so easy to sign up. Just go to patreon.com slash parenting to learn more or click on the Patreon link on any show notes page. If you're into social media, you can follow Tilt Parenting at Tilt Parenting on Instagram and Twitter. Visit the Tilt Parenting page on Facebook or join my Facebook community called Tilt Together. Lastly, please help this podcast stay visible and easily found by subscribing and leaving a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you so much. And that's all for this week. Stay safe, stay well, and take good care. And for more information, visit www.tiltparenting.com. Hey, are you a parent of a teenager? Are you feeling overwhelmed about how to be what they need while also holding limits and boundaries that keep them safe? Are you tired of conversations that negate how messy this season of parenting is? Well, I've got you. My name is Casey O'Rourke. I am a positive discipline trainer, parent coach, and the host of the Joyful Courage podcast. Every week I come to you with an interview, digging into tough topics with experts I trust and solo shows that go deep into the personal growth and mindset needed to raise teens in a way that grows them into confident, capable young people. I am not afraid of getting real about the intersection of conscious parenting and the teen years, while also bringing in vulnerability, humor, and lightness. I'm walking the path with you and honored to serve. Listen to Joyful Courage on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you consume podcasts.